when I was reading, the, you know, this these parts in the book, yeah. it brought me back to um, mm-hmm. when I first got introduced to this kind of mixing it in, mixing yeah, the yeah. coke in to get it over. And, and back in 86, yeah. uh, I started getting some that was in uh, Jamaican or Dominican rum. Oh, yeah. But but the we could only cook that back to crack, which is what we wanted anyway. Yeah, but yeah. Yeah. That we only could though. It, it, we could not bring it back to powder. It could oh, really? only be crack. Mm. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it could only be crack. We had to cook it. We had to literally like cook it like we would normally cook it. Yeah. And you know, like as though we were cooking up, and then you know it would it would come. You know, the oil would drop just like it would if we yeah. were doing it. You know, uh, just with water. And um, but the the there was still like a mild alcohol odor. Though, yeah, yeah. But nobody, nobody mind that. But it was still like a mild rum. Yeah, yeah, it it kind of made uh, it kind of made our product distinct. So what? You know what, what I mean? So when you when you got that when you got the alcohol when you originally got it back in the alcohol in the rum, what would you do just to heat it up to evaporate yep. the alcohol off, and then you'd have yep. the yep the paste, and then and you yep. cook that into crack. Yeah, well, we, we can get the pace. To, you just, that, just, just, just bring it just like we would normally do. Like oh, what, once it, well, once yeah, it well, busts down to the oil, you just hit it with cold water. Bang. What, you wouldn't have to add bicarb or, or, or ammonia or nothing? No. Oh, it was, just, it was in, it was crack already. It was base already. It was coke. It was the, the, the coke was, it was in the bot. It was like in the liquor. The liquor. Yeah, I know. I, know, I don't, know, I don't so, think so, it was, I don't think it was actually. That was based. Really that was, that much was based. liquor in there at all. Yeah, yeah. It was really just the oil, the coke in the water, uh, and with a little bit of rum in it. Yeah, you know yeah. What I mean? <laughs> and you just it was it was it was crazy, but this shit yeah, yeah. was good as hell though. It yeah, was yeah. really fucking strong. <laughs> you know that. Yeah, it was good. <laughs> it was really good. Like yeah. the the customers responded to that shit very well. See, you the know? cocaine back um, in those days was different to the cocaine you get these days. Oh hell yeah! Because they, oh, they, yeah. they just don't make it the same anymore because they can't get the no. chemicals in Colombia or wherever yes. they're making it. They just because there's so much control on the chemicals there, and you know the quantity of chemicals that they need to make the coke. I mean, you're talking tanker loads, you know, yes. like the big oil tanker tankers. Um, yeah. Now that was another that was another question that it came to mind. It was like the amount of chemicals and the types of chemicals that you needed in order to do what yeah. you guys needed in order to do what you were doing those some of those chemicals you had to you had to be like a corporation yeah. that dealt with those particular chemicals for whatever it is that that corporation supposedly did yeah yeah exactly so we 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 particularly with some of the bigger manufacturers that we were sourcing the, the chemicals from we had to basically make it because they would only sell to trade or chemical or companies that required chemicals so we had to basically copycat those or clone those companies and we would get you know write a sign right up a, a van or you know like a magnetic sign so we'd put a, a, the, the company's details on there but we'd put a different telephone number at the bottom and we'd have somebody sat at the end of that phone number just in case the chemical company phoned them up to verify but nine times out of ten they just they, they just accepted our word because we, do, you know, sometimes I would go or we would send other people and we would turn up dressed in overalls in a transit right. van with a sign on the side of the van, cleaning company or painting company. Or my friend had a motocross bike camp, uh, team mm-hmm. and they use a lot of methanol for fuel additive because it makes the fuel burn quicker. Right, right. So th- we had all sorts of backstories and all sorts of excuses for why we needed, particularly in the methanol. Things like acetone is really easy to get because it's n- used for cleaning nail varnish Clean and stuff nails, like that. Yeah, that that's nail easy. Polish, right? That's quite readily available. Uh, hydrochloric acid, a little bit tricky, but that's fairly easy. It's drain cleaner. Um, you know, you, if you look about, you can find the chemicals. It, it was the alcohols, the methanols and stuff like that were the, a little bit tricky, particularly the volumes that we were asking for. Um, what? What what exactly did the uh, the police in Edinburgh uh, uh, find in that apartment in Edinburgh when um yeah when so they, when they told them it was a cocaine lab when it was like this is a cocaine lab what, yeah what so find? the first one that got taken out was actually in Crystal Palace in London mm. and um, uh, things have been going quite well um, you know we were making quite a lot of money things were smooth 
And I was in Cali at this point, uh, seeing the guy over there. I travelled to Ecuador, I sent somebody back from Ecuador, then I'd gone on, on up to Cali to see the guy, have a chat, because we were talking about upscaling things a bit bigger, you know, moving on to shipping containers, larger volume of tents, but, you know, much safer by sea, less risk, you know, take out the uh, X factor of the passengers. So anyway, I'm there seeing him and suddenly all the phones back in London go dead. And uh, we were like, oh, fuck. So the Colombian was married to the niece of the guy in Cali. So it was like family. So he phoned up his niece and he said, look, what's happened? And, uh, and she said, oh, the, the police raided the lab. And the Colombian and the Chilean have been having a fucking party in the lab, having their mm. friends in there. Drinking, smoking, getting high, put cars pulling up, dealing straight out of the lab, broke all the rules, broke all the ground rules, just fucked it up basically. And obviously the police got wise or somebody grasped them up. They went, you know, the police went through the door, they found three kilos of coke in there and powder, all the chemicals, the press, I mean the whole lot. They arrested everybody in there. Uh it was I think it was about eight people in there. Um so my two partners got arrested, the Chilean and the Colombian. And at that point, I kind of got left running the whole thing. So they get remanded. They managed to get telephones in the prison after a little while. So, we, you know, we were able to start up again uh, quite quickly. Uh, but it was at this point that the British police managed to put pressure on the Colombian and they flipped him and he became a, a police informant. And, was that... Was that the bus that made you decide to leave the country and go? No, no, the, the bus that made me decide to leave the country came later. That was the one in Edinburgh. Oh, mm. so the Colombian who is now an informant gets released back in into you know onto the street. I welcome him back, take him down thirty thousand pounds in cash at least in a carrier bag. Say welcome back. Here's your money. I looked after his family. You know, as we said, we would paid all their bills, food, everything. Whilst the, whilst they were both in prison. But anyway, he gets out take him this money, say hi, welcome back. And we carry on. And basically, cutting a bit of a long story short, he just fucked me up. He was working for the police and he just took us all out. And um, like I say, cutting a long story short, I started to get a feeling that he was an informant. I started seeing surveillance around us. Somebody actually told me that I, that I was under surveillance who had a, a police officer, corrupt police officer in London on the payroll. Mm -hmm. So I start paying the same police officer like a weekly to give me the, the, the notes, surveillance notes. So I know what's going on. Um, anyway, things went on and it all came to a head in Edinburgh. I started working with that other Columbia that I mentioned who was doing the extraction for us. So mm -hmm. me and him have started teaming up. So when, you know, I'm now bringing stuff in with two Columbians, the informant and the, and the other one. And the informant's trying to find out where we got this lab up in Edinburgh. And I tell the other one, I said, I said, don't let him know where you're going because he was coming to do the extraction for me. I said, don't let him, for God's sake, know where you're going. And he was like, why? And I said, it doesn't matter why, just don't let him know. Somehow he got followed to Edinburgh so because he came up by train. So they followed, the police followed him up to Edinburgh. They managed to find him in the lab. So then they plot upon the lab mount surveillance on the lab and see us coming and going blah 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 we spot the surveillance or they do uh, and because we spotted the surveillance and the police were aware that we'd seen them that then triggers a bust of the lab in Edinburgh I had got myself out of the way and avoided the bust and they, they again they seized uh, precursor chemicals some drugs not much drugs um and the press, parts of the tent, you know. It was, press is like a 15-ton press, though. 15-ton right? floor stand in hydraulic press. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so they seize all of that. They try and implicate some of my family members, uh, at which point I phone them up and say, look, leave it out. Uh, they're not involved. And they said, well, when are you coming in for questioning? We need to talk to you. And I said, I'm not sure. I'm a bit busy. <laughs> yeah, I'll let I'm you know. I'm a bit busy getting the <laughs> fuck away from y'all. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I knew that I was fucked, basically. I knew that my forensics were going to be all over this 
this lab. And it, and the, 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 the game was up. So I, I head back down to England because obviously this is in Scotland and it's a different law, slightly different laws. Um, uh, so I head back down to England and I, I know that they're going to have to, it's going to be a bit tricky for them to get me. And I know that it's going to take about a month for the forensics to come back at this point. So I thought I've got a little bit of time to get my shit together, close everything down, close all my banks, get rid of all my electronics, uh, you know, phones, everything, clean my flat out and get the fuck out of England, get out of Dodge basically. Mm -hmm. So do all that, click, you know, get all the money out, uh, see a few friends, set up a few things. And, uh, Contacted a Turkish friend of mine who was Turkish mafia. And I said, uh, I said, look, Oscar, can you get me out of the country? And it, cause you know, they're bringing people in and bringing alcohol and cigarettes and all this shit. Uh, and he said, yeah, sure. No problem. I'll, you know, I'll take you out in, in the car. So, uh, you know, said goodbye to my family and decided to go to my dad's house in France, just to get out of the country, uh, you know, so go, just go away for a while, see what happens. So that's uh, your first move. Your first move is. France, that's the first country yeah, you yeah, go to. Yeah. So I get smuggled out of England in the boot of my friend's Mercedes car <laughs> on the mm -hmm. hover speed, on the, on the hover speed out of, uh, Do uh, of a, yeah, Dover to Calais. So I jump in the boot, get out the other side. Uh, they... and, and so people know the, the boot is the trunk. Yeah, the trunk of the car. And yeah, Mercedes yeah. has got quite a big trunk. <laughs> All right. All I can right. tell you. <laughs> Especially back then. Yeah. 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 So it's only 45 minutes to cross it as well, so it's quick, you know. Uh, so I, anyway, I'm now in France. Uh, they, the, the Turkish lot bring me a car because he uh, bring me an English car over and I head off down to my dad's house in France, out in the countryside. And I, you know, at this point I, I'm pretty certain that this Colombian is an informant. So I'm, I'm, I'm feeding him misinformation. I'm trying to confuse the British police. I'm telling him that I'm in Spain. I'm on the border, blah, blah, blah. Go, you know, ringing him from telephone boxes, all this shit. Um, Spend a while in France, a few, like a few months or something, and I decide I'm going to do one last job with the informant, but I'm, I'm not going to pay him. I'm going to rob him. He's not going to get paid this time. Uh, so I think, well, I'm not, go I'm not traveling with a tent, so I should be okay. So I think I'll go out to Ecuador, I'll meet the Colombian from Cali, I'll get the tent, I'll have a mule come out from England, I'll give the tent to the mule, send them back to England, but they're not going to go anywhere near the Colombians. Because I know the extraction process now. I, by this time, I'm, I'm able to do it myself. So I'll get a friend of mine to extract it. I've already talked to him a little bit before I, went, before I disappeared. So I thought, right, well, this will be like, you know, get away money and just basically fuck you to the, to the informant and the English police. <laughs> Trying to be clever, do you know what I mean? And it literally was going to be the last job. And, um, you know, uh, the plan was, like I said, send the, the passenger back to England. I was then going to go back to France, get a change of clothes and go to Thailand for six months. My friend was going to send the money out from the proceeds of that tent to Thailand. And I had a few friends in Thailand with big houses out there. And they, you know, they said, come out, spend six months with us. And they were involved in this, that and the other from Thailand. And, you know, we were going to look and see what we could do from there and see... You know, just Don't they kill you for selling for getting caught selling drugs in China. Oh yeah, I wasn't or... gonna sell anything there, but it was out uh. outward bound. <laughs> but even still, I yeah, yeah. But it was more to get out of the way and, and right. just let things die down a bit and, and just t talk, not really necessarily do stuff, but right. But you know, we had a few things in mind. Um so yeah. Fly out to Ecuador again via Paris this time, Paris, Holland, uh, Quito. But this time when I arrived in Quito, I come off the plane and there was a set of steps down to uh, the passport control. And there was a woman at the bottom of the steps this time with a clipboard, must have had my photo on it because she literally looked, she's looking at all the passages. She looks at the board, sees my face, does a double take and disappears into the back of, into the, an office at the back. And I, at this point, I'm like, she definitely had my photo on that clipboard. You know? I've got about 25 or 30, 25,000 euros in my top pocket. 
in, in big denomination euro notes that I changed in Paris. Uh, dodgy money changer on the Chandelier. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm thinking of what I, you know, what's going through my head is I'm th- hoping I don't get stopped then and there. Anyway, they do stop me. Uh, she, that same woman is at passport control when I get there with a, an officer, superior officer. And I'd never been stopped coming into Ecuador, not once by this point. Be it probably at this, by this stage, I've been there like four or five times. And they said, why are you here? What are you doing? And I was like, it's definitely on top. I thought it's definitely on top. And I said, well, you know, usual stuff, the tourism, blah, blah, blah. And I probably should have gone at that point. You know, I probably should have gone into Ecuador and just disappeared. But me being me, I thought I've done it before. Because I mean, literally, we'd got tents out of Venezuela two at a time under heavy surveillance by the Venezuelans. I mean, literally, they were sat in the lobby of the hotel reading newspapers next to us. And we were talking to them because we knew they were surveillance. And uh, we'd still manage to... talking to them like you were just a guy and they were just a guy. Yeah, just we were taking okay. the piss out of them because we knew they were surveillance. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, 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 and so people know yeah, taking the piss is he was fucking with them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah big yeah, time. He was fucking with them. <laughs> I mean, it's a bit and, stupid. And grassing, we mentioned grassing. And grassing is snitching. All right. Well, I wouldn't say that because, you know, that, that's no, I'm just, no, I'm just saying I'm, I'm just uh, letting our viewers know like because we've used these terms and uh, we didn't explain grassing. We didn't explain that snitching. Oh, in, sorry. In right. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> So, yeah. So the fact that we've done that several times, we've managed to get them out underneath their noses and whatnot. You know, my, my confidence is sky high, you know, over arrogant, egotistical, all that, all the, all the shit, you know. And I'm thinking I'm invincible, you know. I thought, I've done it before, I can do it again. I'm only going to have the tent around me a day or two and then the, the meal will arrive and it will be gone. Happy days. You know, I'm not leaving Ecuador with the tent. So, you know, I just didn't expect to be arrested on the ground sort of thing. I thought it would be at the, at the airport, if, if anywhere. Anyway, the Colombian informant has obviously told the police in England, this is your last chance. This is literally the last job he's doing. If you don't get him now, he's in the wind, he's going to be gone, he's, you know, he's, he's, he's disappearing. Um, so they were ready, <laughs> basically. Um, so I leave the airport, you know, they let me carry on, uh, the Ecuadorians. Go to the hotel, uh, settle in, ring the Colombian, he's already there with the tent. Um, so I think I went and met him the next day in, in his hotel, gave him a load of cash, had a chat, got the tent. And I, as I was leaving his hotel, I remember I bumped into a guy on the steps who was Ecuadorian police. I didn't know it at the time, but I'd, I'd seen him already that day and it stuck in my head. I thought, I've already seen his face once already and I've just bumped into him. That's not right. Cause I'd seen him like a couple of blocks away and it was weird. You know, you know, those weird, uh, and you just remember them because you're sort yeah. of, when you're, when you're at that stage and you're so paranoid and you, you know, you're under surveillance anyway, any little weird things stick in your acuity. head. Acuity, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Your, your mental acuity increases like Massively. In nobody's business, man. It's like almost like superhuman intuition. Yeah. So I should have listened to it. <laughs> that's right. But I didn't. That's what everybody always says, right? Something told me yeah. I should have listened. It right? gets worse, yeah. believe me. I'll tell you now. 